Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Pete Johnson. I'm a graduate student at Boston University. Uh, today I'll be looking at the Frankfurt School's culture industry, how media industries construct selfhood in the neoliberal information age. Uh, just as a brief introduction to the culture industry, uh, in their seminal 1947 book, Dialectic of Enlightenment, neo-Marxist theorist Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer first introduced the idea that cultural products, namely television, radio, and film, operate under the same logic as manufacturing products and are by no means high art, according to them. Instead, all cultural products serve to turn the public into passive consumers who are unaware of broader capitalist structures and any apparent autonomy in popular culture is ultimately illusory. They say, quote, freedom to choose an ideology, which always reflects economic coercion, everywhere proves to be the same, end quote. The culture industry is certainly not without its critics. Subsequent cultural studies and political economic scholars have pointed out that Adorno's view is not only overly cynical, but also fails to acknowledge the agency of individuals who can, in truth, negotiate meanings that are not consonant with the dominant ideology. Recently, media industry scholarship has taken a more pragmatic approach to cultural inst institutions. For David Hall, the culture industries are not run by quote-unquote all-powerful evil capitalists, uh, as his eth ethnographic work instead finds the real truth of media to be more ambiguous, saying, that the culture industries are, quote, complex, ambivalent, and contested, end quote. While this approach provides much-needed pragmatism to Horkheim and Adorno's initial postulation, we should still consider how media theory like this can help us understand how power structures orient audiences in problematic ways, regardless of whether they are ambivalent or intentional. Certainly, the totalizing and pessimistic nature of the Frankfurt School may seem like a far cry from today's fragmented, seemingly democratized media environment, where convergence has provided users with a newfound agency in both the production and consumption of media. However, amid increasing deregulation and conglomeration, the ethos of the culture industry certainly persists just in a new form. I argue that the culture industry has changed in two fundamental ways. First, the culture industry now capitalizes on neoliberal discourses that celebrate individuality to obscure its capitalist structures and deflect social obligations and culture. Second, it has shifted from manufacturing age consumerism to information age consumerism. Today, I'll look specifically at how the Walt Disney Company, its texts, and its data collection all reflect a new iteration of the culture industry that designs viewers as information age consumers. Over the past 40 years, neoliberal logic has come to dominate not only public policy, but also how individuals see themselves in society. In other words, citizens see themselves not as part of a welfare state, but as individuals in charge of their own destinies on the open free market. Accordingly, as viewers now believe they have the power to engage with text and negotiate meaning, this naturalization of neoliberal logic has obscured structural issues and made the culture industry's top-down strategy all the more difficult to pinpoint not to mention allowed institutions to displace the responsibility onto the individual. Operating lock and step with neoliberalism is what I would call information age consumerism, which has been positioned as the solution to personhood today. This is only intensified in the media industries as the lines between Hollywood and Silicon Valley have become blurred. Today, media conglomerates rely on Silicon Valley not only for visual effects and vital infrastructure, but also for data collection and surveillance. Although there's certainly more to say here, Media studies, regardless, must explore how the dynamics of the culture industry have changed today in the digital information age. One example of this new culture industry can be found within the media conglomerate Disney, which obscures its data collection tactics and tries to make it seem as though the production of its content is driven from the bottom up, directly from consumers, when in fact it is quite the opposite. Although Disney certainly emphasizes its magical world and innocuous family fun, in truth, it maintains a robust data analytics division of over 1,000 employees who work to collate and analyze consumer statistics. For example, these data teams carefully monitor the magic bands that Disney customers wear inside Disney parks, collecting everything from customer purchases to geographic movements within the park. Informa information from the magic bands, as well as a litany of other activities, such as viewer behavior at Disney+, 
allow Disney to increase loyalty, upsell customers, and personalize communication. Revealing how the company understands its data, an analyst stated in 2018 recruiting video that, quote, we're trying to get all digital users to make us the central focal point of where they are purchasing content, end quote. Indeed, Disney uses data to develop content and online interfaces that funnel attention to highly specific outcomes, namely increasing customer purchases and loyalty. Further, Disney's data collection strategies play into the misguided neoliberal assumption that content today is demand-driven from the bottom up, and that market research is merely a means to understand user demands. However, Horkheimer and Adorno aptly identify this contemporary corporate strategy when they say, quote, ideology hides itself in probability calculations, end quote. While neoliberal common sense may lead us to believe our preferences drive content, the, quote, law of large numbers, end quote, according to Horkheimer and Adorno, ensure that producers broaden content enough to achieve four-quadrant appeal. Similar how to quote, Similar to how the cultural industry once oriented viewers as consumers of manufacturing goods like toothpaste or shoes, mainstream media today, even family content, orients viewers as information age consumers. One brief example of how Disney orients viewers as consumers of digital age products can be found in the 2015 Pixar film Inside Out, which takes place primarily within the mind of an 11-year-old girl, Riley, where her emotions, joy, sadness, fear, anger, and disgust, are anthropomorphized and given character motivations, namely to dictate Riley's actions and feelings via a factory-like observation tower. At one point, joy and sadness leave this office and enter the depths of Riley's subconscious, coming upon a library of her memories that are stacked on shelves. This visual can seen it, be seen in the bottom right here. Interestingly, the way the film visualizes Riley's memories implicitly mimics and evokes a data center, an example of which is Google's data center seen at the top right here. This visualization not only oversimplifies big data for easy consumption and inoculates the viewer's imagined fear of technology, but it also aligns Riley's subjectivity with that of a machine, reinforcing the neoliberal policy position that, quote, corporations are people. Whether ambivalent or not, conglomerates normalize information age phenomena like data centers and orient individuals to effectively sympathize with their non-human assets. There's certainly more to be said here, such as the fact that Pixar movies provide lessons on growing up and teach viewers how to survive alone in the world and thereby textually perpetuate neoliberal capitalism. Although anti-politically correct discourses today may encourage us to avoid such analyses because quote, these are just kids' movies after all, end quote, uh, such dismissiveness only benefits Disney as it obscures how the company's depiction of selfhood generates false psychological needs to turn continually again and again to Disney and its products for fulfillment. In conclusion, textual analyses of Disney's texts and internal corporate discourses regarding data reveal how the cultural industry is still very relevant today. My attempt here is not to overemphasize media effects or brainwashing of youth. Instead, it's to encourage us to look at how capitalism perpetuates itself textually and paratextually. Although Horkheimer and Adorno's postulation may certainly overlook user engagement, this does not discount its applicability to the corporate logic that drives modern-day media. This grows increasingly relevant as capitalist motivations are laid bare in the many PR misfires amid COVID-19 particularly in Disney's premature and blatantly self-interested reopening of Disney World. My hope is that future scholarship, including my own, will bridge the gap between theory and praxis, not only by encouraging policy prescriptions and digital activism, but also by engaging with non-critical business scholarship. I say this because consumers are becoming more literate in culture issues and demanding, on the part of private, demanding action on the part of private companies, and the corporate world should take notice. Indeed, by taking responsibility, offering more transparency around data and production, and interrogating neoliberal orientation of their content, corporations can be engaged by academia, and we can help them engage, enact long-term structural changes in an effort to align ethics with profitability. Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to your questions and comments at the conclusion of this panel.